Some texts in the Bible have, for me at least, an immediate appeal. In today's Gospel reading, Jesus takes a little child, sets the child amongst his disciples, picks up the child, and then says, whoever welcomes a child like this welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, not, welcomes not just me, but welcomes the one who sent me. As you heard, the disciples had been arguing with themselves who was the greatest amongst them. So Jesus turns the definition of greatness on its head in the disciple business Greatness means being the least of all and the servant of all. And in that culture, a child was the least of all. Now, a text like that will preach. I mean, it, it really preaches itself. If the preacher needs an illustration, all he's got to do is go over to the nursery, bring a child over here, and lift him up and say, point taken. Other texts, however, are homiletical landmines. That epistle of James, for instance, Martin Luther called it the epistle of straw because he was afraid it undermined grace and encouraged works righteousness. And that first reading, that first reading from the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, it's also radioactive. Proverbs is a collection of sayings for folks who want to get ahead, who want to win friends and influence people. It's a field guide for living in the royal court of King Solomon and also for approaching life in general. I think if you were to print it on its own today, no question it would be in the self-help section of the bookstore or on Amazon.com. William Willimon writes, Proverbs is not one of my favorite books in the Bible. There is virtually no God in Proverbs. What you have in Proverbs are lists of do's and don'ts. Don't drink too much, get up early in the morning, go to bed early in the evening, don't talk too much in groups, a fool and his money are soon parted, that kind of thing. There's not much God in Proverbs because, well, if you can do all these good things that Proverbs urges, you don't really need God. Proverbs is that book of the Bible for people who find it easy to be good, people who are high achievers, spiritually speaking. That kid in the fourth grade who the teacher left in charge while she went down to the principal's office to write down the names of malefactors while she was out of the classroom. That kid loves Proverbs. <laughs> That's why, says William Williman, I can't stand this book and I could never stand that kid. <laughs> well, I understand William Williman's objections. I don't altogether share them. I was that kid in the fourth grade. <laughs> Somebody had to write down the names for the teacher, usually me. The subject, or rather the heroine of today's Old Testament reading, is that quintessential virtuous woman, at least from the perspective of an ancient Eastern man. When I was a pastor in rural Virginia, there were several times when I was asked to read this passage at the funeral of a lady who was in her 80s or 90s. And for many in that generation that lived before women's liberation, this was a quintessential text. This overachiever was the woman's model. Each line in this poem begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So from A to Z, this woman gets the job done. She spins wool and flax. She gets up before sunup and organizes the women and the servants while the men and the boys are still asleep. She buys the field, she plants the vineyard, she harvests the grapes, she makes the wine, she pours it out for her husband without spilling a single drop. 
She drives a hard bargain in the marketplace, but she has a soft place in her heart for the poor. She dresses her family stylishly in clothes she makes herself on a second-hand Singer sewing machine. The clothes she has left over she sells to those fussy boutiques in the mall. Her children are beautiful. They all go to gifted classes. They never give their parents any lip. Best of all, according to this text, this woman makes her husband look good. He can sit in the city gate and hear the elders and other men praise his wife. Such a wife you have. I should be so lucky. Now, how this woman is regarded by other women, I'm not so sure. You have to wonder if in her sewing circle, there are women as generous in their praise of her as the male writer of this poem. Jill uh, Duffield is the editor of the Presbyterian Outlook, and she's the mother of three. She says this woman in Proverbs 31 is the superwoman of her day, but she does not say it necessarily with admiration. Jill writes, Homemaker, entrepreneur, wise, supportive, beloved, God-fearing, and all done backwards and in high heels. Her Facebook page would be littered with photos of healthy school lunches packed with precision and beauty the night before with captions saying, so easy, the kids just love my homemade granola bars and my organic hummus. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm debating which kid will complain the least about having the heels of the bread make up their peanut butter and jelly sandwich because I neglected to go to the grocery store. The middle one complains the least. Sorry, honey, I'll try and make it up to you later. Owed to a capable wife just makes me feel inadequate and therefore crabby. On the one hand, there is much to admire in this old-fashioned lady. She could be the CEO of any Fortune 500 company if only she hadn't lived in the 5th century, B 2nd century BC. On the other hand, for all her virtues, she seems to have no standing apart from the good she does her husband. Truth be told, this woman reminds me very much of my grandmother, who could milk a cow, plow a field, pick bales of cotton with her bare hands, and with those same rough, calloused hands, make tiny, fashionable clothes for my two sisters' Barbie dolls. My grandmother never finished high school, but she could quote the Bible better than any seminary professor I ever met and do it while making up a batch of wild plum jelly made from plums that she had picked herself. But Opal Shive Lovelace did not measure her worth slowly by the prestige she brought her husband, who worked just as hard as she did trying to scratch a living from the red sand of a West Texas farm, she knew herself to be first and foremost a precious child of God, a sinner saved by grace, a lamb of God's own fold. She didn't live her life to please her husband. She lived her life to show her gratitude to God who loved her first. If you ask my grandmother which passage of scripture she liked the most, it would not be this ode to the virtuous woman. It would have been that story about Jesus setting a child amongst his disciples, his status-conscious disciples. My grandmother was the least of all and the servant of all, but if you had said that to her, she would have laughed in your face and told you to quit speaking nonsense. At least one commentator I consulted said that this passage, the best thing to do with it for the preacher would be just to ignore it. In his opinion, the text is hopelessly mired in patriarchy 
and unworthy of a modern congregation's attention, this particular scholar was complaining that the lectionary committee still included it in the cycle of readings. I have more respect for modern Christian women than this. This idealized perfect wife of ancient times is hardly the perfect model for modern Christian women, but you got to admit, boy, she has some backbone. You can see this woman, if you see her solely as a victim of male chauvinism, then you are not reading the text carefully. If anything, it's men who come off badly in this passage. All they seem to do is sit around in the city gate criticizing or praising other people's wives. This woman isn't Wilma Wallflower. She's more like, like Sojourner Truth, the former slave who electrified the women's convention when it met in Akron, Ohio in 1851 after a man had told this assembly of women that they, women should be cosseted and protected, Sojourner Truth stood up and said, that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and have the best places everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. Ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arm. I plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. Ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. Ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off into slavery. And when I cried out my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. Ain't I a woman? Then that little man in black there says, women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where'd your Christ come from? From God and from a woman. Man had nothing to do with it. <laughs> if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, then these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. Now ain't this figure in Proverbs a woman? You bet she is. I think the best thing we can do is to let her be who she is and to thank God that the man who wrote this ancient poem so long ago does not have the final word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.